right, welcome to another episode of Duck It. Today we host Hadir. Long, long time. Thanks for joining us, Hadir. How are you doing? Thank you for having me, Chris. Really long, long happy time. to be with you and with Stephen, both people that I absolutely <laughs> admire. So happy we're together again somehow on one screen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. This time we're not arguing about you know marketing assets and campaign. <laughs> Oh, local I, I local marketing. <laughs> um, so really awesome to have you on. Um, uh, you know, just one rule on this show. Um, uh, you can't avoid a question. Just kidding. Just kidding. It's called. <laughs> so so if, if we say something or we ask you something that you want to avoid, of course, you can duck the question. Uh, but awesome. then deal with the embarrassment of us, you know, making sure that you realize that you didn't answer the question. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'll have so. the expectation coming with you. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, so, you know, you were um, um, really one of the true, 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 true early joiners of Kedim, um, really one of, uh, I would say, the founding members of, of, of kind of the core team of Kedim at the time. You're actually one of the few people that, um, that we've, you know, had on the show, because um, we had a few Kareemers on the show um, that was actually there, you know, before me um, and, and, and before, you know, uh, my era. You, you were there, I think, uh, even probably you know six seven maybe eight months before I was maybe even a year I don't even remember when you joined sometime yeah, I joined uh, November 2014 yeah so a few months before me so um, I mean things have changed uh, the journey has been an incredible one I think you did over you did what you did probably like five years at Kedim five and a half years yes wow <laughs> so, so how would you characterize and how would you represent kind of um, your journey uh, okay. Wow, that's a, that's a big if, if, question. If, if you could do it within like five minutes, because we got other things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it, uh, it was a roller coaster, right? Like, yeah. uh, I think every year had a theme somehow. I can't just say how the experience in Karim was. Uh, I think the first two years, it felt as if um, I was getting promoted every three months, you know, uh, just because the reality <laughs> of the role was changing, the scale, yeah. the team you were leading was completely different. Um, and it took a bit of time to reflect on that experience as well after I left. Um, just realizing how we were a very, very small room of people saying, let's be a unicorn, a term we were not even aware of what it means at the time back then in 2014. And then becoming that unicorn and then exiting the biggest, uh, one of the biggest startups in the world. It's, it was a magical experience. That's, that's what I can tell you. Yeah, I mean, you before you joined Karim, you were... That's one similarity I think you and me had in our Karim journey is we were already sort of in the in the ride hailing space in in a way you you had you had launched uh, a taxi kind of uh, solution in Sahel, right? Yeah, um, taxi Sahel, yes. Yeah, and 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 that was where you got your taste of like crazy startup life. Um, yeah. And then when you joined Karim, you were <clears throat> you were obviously leading and building. Um, the Egyptian kind of um, uh, you know operation for Karim, which eventually became at some point the biggest operation of Karim, um, and, and and I can only imagine how that kind of changed. And I think I think yeah. what you said about you know the role ever changing was the reality of of the experience, and 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 what was the kind of at least in my experience as well was the biggest takeaway of being able yeah. to adapt and grow like crazy. I have um I have a question that I always wanted to ask you um, ever since our Karim days. Um, just because the nature of the business changed so much and it's not so much about Karim, but more about you. Um, you know, you're obviously a great, you know, uh, builder of teams and organizations um, for a variety of reasons. And I think most of them are, um, if, if I may uh, say that it's, it's based on you and, and your human kind of character and your personality and your, your ability to kind of infect people with your ambition and motivation and, and, and energy. At some point, you had to, uh, and you decided to change your role at Kerim, and, and you went from, um, you know, running the Egyptian operation to kind of uh, joining the core team uh, centrally in Dubai. Um, looking back, if you had to say which part was what was more fun and which part you enjoyed the most, was it, yeah. was, it was it building Egypt or was it being part of a central uh, yeah. core global team? What what, what did you prefer? Yeah, so in a heartbeat, I will tell you, it was a lot more fun being the GM in Egypt. Uh, but that's mostly because of who I am. Like, I enjoy building things from scratch, um, being very close to the market, to the operations, seeing what's happening on the ground. And just, you know, this feeling that you do one thing and then not even the next day, the next minute you see the impact of your work. Um, and that's, that's a very 
satisfying feeling, I would say. Um, so yeah, I would say the first role for sure for me was more exciting, even though the second one, you can say it was more senior or people see it that a global role is something that they would maybe work for. And I enjoyed it a lot. Like I really, really learned a lot from that role as well. But if you ask me what keeps me, um, like what wakes me up every morning, it's the kind of job I had at the very beginning uh, launching Karim and Egypt. And I guess on, on the back of that question, and I think all of us struggle with that a little bit. Um, as you look forward, and I think as I look forward, as Steve looks forward too, like a part of you wants to believe that at some point, you know, we need to slow down and we need to kind of um, hone our skills, maybe become a bit more specialized um, and maybe become more senior and centralized in our, in our positions, uh, whatever we do in our career. Mm. But I hate that shit. I completely hate it. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it makes me crazy. Yeah. I get really bored out of my mind. I know Steve and I are on the same page on this. Um, how do you go from being a super successful builder, startupper, to um, finding your next role? Uh, especially when the next role might be, you know, starting from scratch and building from scratch. You know what I mean? How do you find your yeah. next task? How do you find your next challenge? Um, I'm curious yeah. how you think about so, that. Uh, yeah, so it, it's interesting. Like how I believe in it in my life in general is I believe each phase somehow has a purpose, right? Like there is a phase, uh, that's how I see it. Uh, one phase that is more on the gaming side, so it's for learning. And one phase is for enjoying and using what you've learned. And I've always done that. Like every few years, it's a change of, of, of phase. So I enjoy building things. I enjoy starting new things. That's what I really enjoy and what I'm good at. But I cannot keep on doing this my whole life. In the middle, you kind of somehow need to challenge yourself and do something yeah. out of your comfort zone because that's how you get to learn. And, and graduated, it has been that way. I, I start something for, for a bit and then go uh, 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 and learn somehow. And that was exactly the purpose of my move to Dubai. If I had continued being the GM here in Egypt, already the last few months, I could feel my learning curve was already you know, doing that. So yeah, I'm, I'm good at doing it, but what am I gaining at the age of 27, right? Um, so I think it was a great decision doing Dubai or doing a central role for two years, gaining, learning, and then now I want again to go start my own thing, but now I'm a much stronger person than who I was two or three years ago. Yeah, what was your biggest, um, <clears throat> thinking back to, uh, to our days, I mean, I only operated out of, um, out of the, the central Dubai team. What was the biggest challenge for you shifting from that local mindset into kind of that central global role, given uh, you know, some of the operational challenges of the business and kind of the roles themselves. Yeah. Two, two main things that uh, I remember. The first one is uh, when you're leading your own team, uh, it's quite easy to make decisions and you know they're going to happen, right? Because it's your own team. Uh, but when you're in a central role, which you both can relate to because <laughs> that's how we argued all the time, you guys are central team and local team. Debated, um, argued, so debated. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Very few times. <laughs> um, so when you're in the central team, man, like it's hard convincing people to do what you think is right in Pakistan, in Egypt, in Qatar, in Saudi. Like it's crazy how when you work with 15 different countries, each one has a different reality. That, that's a very big challenge that I have to learn how to maneuver around this um, and somehow convince them with, with what you want or even just start learning about their different realities as well. Um, so that was one challenge. Um, the second challenge for me was uh, back in Egypt, I had a huge team, right? So the challenge here was making very big decisions. It was how to encourage and motivate a big team of 100 people to make things happen. Um, so it was a very different challenge. Going to Dubai, the first few months, I was completely alone on my team. And then even when I had people, I had two, three people on my team. So it's a very different reality. The kind of work you need to do is just completely different. It's not about motivating or encouraging uh, a big amount of people, but is doing very different things. Absolutely, and and yeah, totally. I, I have a I have a uh, kind of a deviation of question here, um, and and sure. I've always I've always admired you big time in terms of your ability to motivate people. Your your presentation and motivational skills are are, are awesome. Um, I have um, a strange question. I think you know the startup community in the Middle East um, is one that's, you know, growing exponentially. I think um, the amount of startups that are coming out, the amount of VC, the amount of money, the amount of opportunity has kind of completely changed yeah. since, um, since, you know, 
I guess over the last five, six years. But one thing we started. I, yeah, but, but one thing that I feel that hasn't really changed is um, I hate to say this is um, I, I, unless I'm, I'm I'm wrong, I haven't seen many um, you know strong um, um, uh, and burgeoning female entrepreneurs, women. Um, there are there are some, um, and but I haven't seen an increase. Um, you know, there's still quite uh, you know a, a, a big you know there's vast but vast majority are men and a small proportion are women. And I don't, I haven't seen a ratio change or difference change. Um, what do you think yep. kind of, why is that in, in your opinion? And, and, and how do you think about that person and what your role might be? Yeah. Well, that is, it's a good question. Um, I, I wouldn't say I know the reason why. Um, I have seen, of course, uh, a few very successful entrepreneurs that are females, but you're right. It's not like the rate is increasing somehow, at least not that something that we can see with like ourselves. Um, what's our role or what's my role per se is, uh, I think, uh, even though it sounds cheesy, but I think inspiration somehow is something that yeah. comes in that regard that I really, really believe in, uh, that a lot of women, they just need to see other women like them that have done that, that have uh, the risk that have gone out of their way and that they become successful. Um, a lot of people think or they like to say, oh, but women, you know, they're being treated equally or things are harder for them. To be completely honest, Chris, I think it's the opposite. To be honest, I think as a woman, you actually get a lot of perks more than men yeah. somehow because you're a woman, people want to listen to you, they want to talk to you. It's not awkward for you to go speak to a guy and network with him, even though vice versa is actually quite awkward if you're a guy in a random networking event it's not quite easy to just go speak to a couple of, uh, of women, right? Uh, yeah. The opposite is, is much easier though. Um, so if anything, um, I've seen more issues being young in that ecosystem than I have seen being because of being a woman. Um, so again, I think it's, it's our role as entrepreneurs to encourage more women to do that as VCs as well, which you've seen maybe a few VCs that are more encouraging to women that only invest in startups that have women as co-founders. Yeah. Um, so maybe seeing more examples of this. Yeah, it's strange because um, when, when you look at stats generally, and I don't know them on top of my head, but, but um, you know, women in, in, in education, graduating from universities, et cetera, et cetera, is, is proportionally either equal to or sometimes more than the men in the region. And, and what I'm finding kind of strange is that it doesn't permeate, it doesn't continue throughout, right? Uh, yeah, uh, actually, just one thing I need to tell you as well, because I've studied this a bit, a bit or researched it a bit, and... Another thing, um, maybe better a doctor can speak about this or a psychologist, but another thing is that women by nature are not as confident as men. Um, they don't, they, at least a lot of them don't necessarily feel that, I mean, if you think about it, being a founder needs a hell load of confidence that you believe in, in an idea that almost 99.9% .9 of people around you don't believe in it. So if by nature your yeah. gender is not that confident, then it's something we need to build. And that's true. Like I, I, I think about my upbringing and I think about the society that I was brought up in. So I, I, I grew up in the Middle East as well um, to, to an Arab father. Um, and, and I remember growing up, I think th the one thing that was super consistent was uh, I was raised to believe that I could literally do anything. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Same, that, same that, for me, by the way. Exactly. And uh, I think that's, yeah. that, and, that, and, that, and that's what I'd love to get to. And I, and I'm not sure that's true for most women in the region. Right. I don't think, yeah. I don't think, you know, and, and I, I shouldn't speak uh, for the region, but I know that, you know, yeah. growing up to, you know, in an Arabic family, in an Arabic society to an Arabic father, I, yep. the one thing that was true. And uh, even to this day, I naively believe I can do anything in the world. There's nothing. I can't <laughs> do, right? and, and I think, that's, you know, and I think uh, that's the most amazing asset. Right. Yeah, I love when you said the word naive because I always use that word when people say, how did you start Taxi Seha? And I'm like, guys, I think I was just so naive. I yeah. did not realize it's that hard to start a startup. I didn't know it's hard to have a startup that becomes successful. So I went for it. Maybe if I knew, I'd be scared to do yeah. it, to be completely yeah, yeah. honest. But think about it. When you were starting your first initiative or two, when we were even joining Kareem, people thought we were crazy. You're yeah. joining a taxi company. You had the best education in the country and you're going for a taxi company. <laughs> and in taxi, I used to drive myself. I used to have my dad drive too. So people are like, dude, you're crazy. Like you, you were living abroad. Now you come back to Egypt to drive cars back and forth. Uh, what kind of future are you making for yourself? So it's a huge amount of confidence to be able yeah. to go completely against uh, the society you're living in. Yeah, yeah. I mean, 
starting a company or, or having any ambition to start a company or a startup in itself is naive, right? Of course, like whether you're <laughs> a woman, whether you're a man or a woman, like just the idea of starting a company in general is extremely daunting. So you have to go in naive. But on top of that, I think uh, for women in the region, not only is it about being a startup, but it's about being a woman and doing it. Um, I guess I guess in this environment, the society must be challenging. So that, 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 that confidence that you're talking about absolutely is important. Um, so how come... Just to, just on that, is that the um, just to no, just to jump in on this because it's an interesting topic. The um, the fact that we're talking about confidence as you know starting a business or a startup. So I I've not not founded a company, but um, you know that confidence that that comes from that is that the system that, that we're talking about. We're saying that on one front you're saying that you go out get a job, you know stable income is one thing, you know, and then from a female perspective, is there there's that aspect of you know. There, there's something that we're conforming to because this is something that you know fundamentally should shift is changing or is is that a conversation that isn't necessarily happening to the extent that we think it should uh, uh, you know, what do you mean what, what do you mean exactly Steve just uh, so like the conversation yeah. around um, you know confidence and going out starting a business if you're a fe- you know from a, from a female perspective or from a male perspective you know there this shouldn't necessarily still be a stigma in society today but it still it still is there. So I guess you know what conversations are happening or should be happening that aren't happening, um, you know, in your opinion that uh, that could start to change that and provide um, more young uh, female entrepreneurs the confidence to go out and start something. Yeah. Um, if, I, if I understood you correctly, so you're saying if there's a stigma about women versus men in the workplace in general? No, or starting a business. Just or starting you know, a business. Yeah. 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 Well, I, to be honest. Again, uh, like I'm exposed to a small percentage of the society, right? Like I can't speak on behalf of the whole society that we live in. Um, but to be completely frank, from what I've seen, I don't think there is a stigma, uh, at least in the startup world, against women. If anything, I've seen investors that prefer to have a female on the, on the board or on the co-founding team of a startup just because their strengths are very different, their attention to detail, their ability to multifunction, um, and if you think about it, most people that are in the startup world are actually, are actually quite open as well. They're very mm-hmm. open-minded. They understand mm-hmm. those things. They've seen the data globally that Chris, I've seen you even uh, present before in one yeah. of the conferences. Um, so I, I cannot imagine, or at least in my last six, seven years in the startup world, I haven't seen something that would tell me there's a, some sort of a discrimination in that regard. Yeah, yeah I think, I think. On I you know last point on this question, I just want to ask you where, where did where does your confidence come from in your opinion? Like, where if you could yeah. you know, pinpoint one place, where did it yeah. start? Um, I think like a big part of it is my parents for sure. Uh, they gave me that confidence as a kid. They always uh, raised me up in a way that made me believe that if I want something, I just have to work for it, and it happens somehow. And I guess I was lucky enough that as a kid, a lot of things I worked for kind of happened. Um, so I joined a, a volleyball team. I end up doing well if I work hard. Um, I apply for certain roles. And I mean, don't get me wrong, I failed as well in, in, in different uh, situations. But it was obvious that the more you work for something, you get it. So that somehow, I think, built uh, that kind of confidence. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's the way I was raised, mostly. Yeah. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think, you know, I, I think a lot of our experiences professionally played a role, but I think more importantly, I think, you know, the way you're raised, your parents, uh, what they make you believe, the confidence they give you, that, that yeah. security as well, and that, and, and, yeah. and that belief that, that, that you can try and fail, and that's okay too. I think yeah. that's core. But honestly, I, I, I think, Chris, one, 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 one other thing on that point, I think is the reality of the country I was raised in as well. Like in Egypt, nothing that's impossible you know uh, like, there's nothing that you can say no 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 if this is the case you cannot change it i feel like in a country like egypt you can always maneuver around things you can always change things and maybe that's how a lot of egyptians are raised that way as well yeah i completely agree i completely completely agree it has pros yeah. and cons of course but that's why <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah definitely um <laughs> Yeah. I think a younger generation coming through now as well are, you know, this, you know, that belief, that confidence to change, do your own thing. I, I personally, I really feel that. I, I really see a difference from, yeah, yeah. you know, speaking from a 30 something uh, position. 
Um, yeah. It's a totally different, totally different era that people are, are coming into the workplace for. No, I, I completely agree, and it makes sense again because of the exposure that yeah. those kids are getting different than us. Yeah, when we started, uh, or when I got into the startup world uh, seven years ago. I didn't have any friends that have done this before. I, I haven't seen any startup that has exited before, right? Uh, but if a new generation is coming up now, at least they have a few successful examples they can look up to and say, okay, there is belief. Now let's just try to do the same thing. Yeah, yeah. But um, on that note, um, on that note, um, what are you going to do next? Yeah, see, as much as all the benefits and amazing things that came out of Kareem, that's one thing. Uh, it kind of ruined the future for us because how can you top that, right? <laughs> like, how can you top something like this? Uh, and that's a problem I've been facing. Uh, so I left Kareem back in Feb. Um, and since then, I've been reflecting a lot, a lot, a lot. I, I took a proper break. Uh, of course, initially, I planned to travel the world to do this properly. <laughs> Uh, but as you can tell, because of COVID-19, I've been doing the reflection all the way from home. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, it took me a bit of time to realize what I want to do. Like, like, you know how we always ask this question of, if you have no limitations, what would you really, really yeah. do? Yeah. Uh, you always think it's an easy question to answer, but when you're in the situation, uh, it's obviously not that easy. Yeah. Um, but one thing I know for a fact is I like solving problems. That's something I really, really enjoy. Uh, I used to think I really want to fix or solve problems that are big because when you come with the background of Kareem, you really want to do something scalable. Sure. Uh, but I'm starting to feel that's not the motivation really. Like if I can solve a problem for one person or 10 people or 100 people instead of a million, it's still solving a problem that is big for someone. Um, so it has been taking me some time to figure out what is this one thing uh, or maybe a few things that are big enough and exciting for me. I, I believe you have to work on something that's exciting for you. Sure. It's not about not finding a problem. There are millions of problems around us every day. But what is something really that I can work on 24-7, not be bored, not be tired, uh, have sleepless nights if I need to because I'm so passionate about it. Um, so this is one direction of things I, I want to do as the next step. Uh, but I'm not in a hurry. Like I don't mind starting that with the right idea yeah, comes up. Uh, the second thing I'm doing at the moment is I'm actually consulting slash mentoring some startups. So the payback you're saying or the responsibility that you're saying, how can we help some of those startups that I really believe in, that I believe could be uh, huge in the region. Um, that is something I'm giving also some of my time for. Uh, and the third thing is I, I got certified in corporate governance. Uh, so I'm starting also exploring the idea of being on the board of some startups. Um, if you can see like all those three things, somehow go into the, 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 uh, like the umbrella of wanting to really be part of different industries in the startup world and somehow help even if it's through different ways um, using the knowledge that we gained from Kareem. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's, it's quite incredible, by the way. I think, um, you know, on the second point that you're working on, like mentoring startups, you know, I, I, I personally, I don't know if Steve, you have something to say about this, but I, I, I never personally took it seriously. And I thought it was like, like, you know, like, you know, how am I going to actually mentor? How is it going to actually be valuable? Yeah. Um, and I used to always kind of feel that, you know, the main thing we can do to help people is give them access to a network or give them access to people that they probably don't have access to that can help them. But as we, as we progressed and as we created Duck Life as an advisory, I think we started to realize what we take for granted and what we think is yes. so easy and yes. so logical and so rational. So many startups and founders and, and businesses have no idea. They don't even yep. know how to approach the solution for a problem, right? They, 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 they really get stuck at fundamental things that we take for granted because we were solving them at a rate that was so quick uh, and ever changing for years and years and years. Um, and, you know, whether it was at, 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 at Taxi Sahel or whether it was at Kareem or whether it was at, at Rocket Internet, where it was anywhere, we were solving these problems for years and years and years. And, we don't realize the value of these answers. We don't, you know, we, we don't yep. understand the value of that experience. And since we started Duck Life, I think, I think you're probably encountering this too, is that, man, the, the amount of information and experience that we have in our hands and in our brains is, 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 is something that's extremely valuable. And I feel like, I feel super responsible to kind of share that as well. Um, so it's really interesting to see that, that, that you're doing that too. But 
but yeah, it's 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 obvious to us, but it's not obvious to most people. So I, I think I that, can't agree more. I can't, I actually wanted to say exactly the same thing you just said. Crazy. It's crazy. Like yeah. sometimes we sit with people and we're like, okay, uh, you know, where are you stuck? Where can we help you? And then they ask us these yeah. questions and we're like, really? <laughs> Like, yeah, and you it? give them the yeah. solutions that uh, like, we've been using for like three, four years that you yeah, think yeah. everyone knows, but yeah. no, it's not common yeah. knowledge. At all, it's, at all. It's only when you step away that the, um, so exactly what you're saying, Chris, the being in the weeds of everything every single day and solving things as we were, you really do take it for granted. Like the, the conversations that you can have with anyone um, and from a mentorship point of view, or even just a general advice, like live there, being there uh, and yeah. kind of, we failed, and some of the, one of the things that we talk about in Duck Life is we've been there. And we've, you know, part of the advice that we give um, you know, some of the people we work with is like we've been there, done that, and failed. Like, the, the, you know, this doesn't exactly. necessarily work. Exactly. So, yeah. you know, that's the value that you can bring as a mentor, and I'm sure that's yeah. what you're doing. You know, <laughs> we've tried this. This is the approach we took. It's super logical. It doesn't work. Um, <laughs> good work. You know, we can tweak it and try it that way. But that, you know, that brings a ton of value. And the thing about when you're mentoring as well as startups, if you can save them time and money from those uh, exchanges no matter how big or small um, yeah. then that is a huge contribution to uh, to a startup in the early stage no matter what that's a very good point uh, Stephen, about the saving time right yeah. we learned it the hard way we didn't we had no idea how to do this it took us a few months or sometimes a few years to find out things that we can just tell someone in an hour exactly right? exactly which I, a big learning for me in the last few years um, I think when you also leave something, it's important that we somehow try to detach from the feelings that we had when we were in that experience, which is again, not very easy, especially for entrepreneurs that are usually very passionate and very emotional. Uh, but I learned that when I was exiting Taxi Sahel to Karim because uh, I sold Taxi Sahel to Karim uh, a few months after joining Karim actually. And it was a very, very tough decision at the time. It was, you know, my baby, my startup that I had dreams for. And now you're asking me just to give that to some stranger uh, yeah. that's going to, like, you know, control that somehow. Um, so detaching from those feelings was extremely hard. And now trying to detach from Karim is hard as well. But I think if we don't do that, it becomes extremely hectic yeah. And, and, yeah, not healthy in, in any way. And, and, and also, it's not the same organization right it's it's exactly. a different organization at a different life cycle a different stage in its brand so it's not supposed to be the same kareem we left right it's not supposed yeah. to right so uh you know like like myself i'm not the same person i was five years ago i've grown i've learned i've experienced i think the same thing for you Hadir, and for you steve so mm-hmm. so it, it is natural that that it, that we don't fit anymore i'm sure if i if i went back to kareem i would not want to be there right so yeah, it's, it's, it's a very uh, different organization and and, 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 and different types of people and different types of organizations are there based on the needs of, of, of where they are. Um, but, but super interesting. Um, I think, yeah. I think one last kind of, I guess, direction, which, you know, I, I'd love to pick your brain on is, um, you know, obviously, um, you know, a lot of the people that were at Kareem have uh, operational experience. A lot of people that have been in the startup community who've had, you know, successful exits and stuff like that. We've all felt kind of, um, you know, the benefits of, of, of that risk of that journey. And we've, we've had an amazing amount of knowledge um, and experience and amazing amount of opportunity now, you know, moving forward. We're now in a world that doesn't look anything like what it did six months ago. Nothing, yep. none of the rules that were there, none of the kind of benchmarks that existed yep. are there anymore. Yep. Um, and I feel like, a lot of the struggle and a lot of the pain is, and a lot of the problems are now compounded. There's way more. You know, we look at yeah. uh, Lebanon, we look at um, the Gulf, we even look at Dubai, and we look at you know Egypt. Unemployment is, again, a big problem. What happened with COVID, um, unfortunately, is impacting everybody globally. It's not a regional thing anymore, but generally, suffering and pain and problems are on a rise again, right, um, yeah. in the region. Um, and you know it, it's a super weird thing i think for people like us because the end of 2019 and the beginning of 2020 was when we had you know most of the payouts um, of our of our Kareem experience and when a lot of people were experiencing fear and instability and losing their jobs or or on on, on the other side people at Kareem who had the the exits were experiencing the biggest payout of their lives yeah 
So it's kind of, it's, it's, I don't know about you, but I feel super like, like super responsible. I feel like we have to do something. I feel like our, our, our mandate, our responsibility is to build, yeah. you know, products and solutions quickly. It's to, you know, help, you know, invest uh, as angels or as, 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 as players in the ecosystem more actively because we have a responsibility, right? So I look at, and I wonder how you look at it. I look at, you know, end of 2020, beginning of 2021 as, as a huge uh, era of responsibility for people in the region who have, one, been privileged financially, two, been privileged with experience and knowledge of building startups and solving problems. And, and I feel like we are extremely um, responsible to help rebuild because I feel that our region, I mean, we talk about Egypt, we talk about Lebanon recently, uh, we talk about it every day, Steve and I. Um, yes, it's a global issue, COVID, but I feel like regionally, we were not in a good place to begin with. Uh, we were in a difficult region, and now I feel super responsible. And I feel like any plans that we had, we have to accelerate them, we have to move faster. Um, yep. If it's not us, who? Because, you know, we we're talking about, and sorry for the long question, but we we're talking about, you know, five years ago, you know, for me, the startup, Middle East startup uh, journey started in 2013 with Rocket Internet and tax, Easy Taxi yeah. and stuff like that. But there were no VCs. Yeah. There were like, there was like maybe one or two. Today, there's like a hundred. There, yeah. there was no tech talent. You had to go find them externally and bring them. There was no belief in building companies. Today, all of that is there, but... Mm but I still don't feel confident in the ecosystem. It's weird. I don't trust okay. the ecosystem. And now given what's happening, I almost feel like, okay, Mabruk, good for you, Karim guys, Karim Mafia, and whoever else uh, in the region, not just the Karim Mafia, but any other successful exit. But now is when you're responsible. Now is when you have to go back and give back because you've received a lot. We've yeah. given a lot, but now we're giving back. Now I feel like I have to, we have to, we have to move faster. What are we doing? Yalla, let's go. You know? And I, I, I don't okay. know. I don't know how you feel about that, but I feel that I'm wondering. Okay. Uh, so that, that, that's a lot of uh, <laughs> feelings. <laughs> so let, let me try to tackle uh, some of the points you just mentioned. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's a very tough time that we're passing through and I'm really sorry for what happened in Lebanon as well. It breaks my heart every day. Uh, I've lived in Lebanon as well for a year, so yeah. just seeing everything my friends are going through, it's really, really sad. Um, so yeah, just a lot of respect for all the Lebanese, since you're Lebanese as well, because I think you guys are the most uh, positive people that I've ever uh, worked with or got to know. Um, so that's just one part out of the question. Yeah. Um, so, so I'm an optimist by nature, to be honest. Uh, and uh, at some point I had to give a session to entrepreneurs about COVID-19 and how to deal with it. And it was a very hard to come up with the content of that session a few months back when it was just the peak of everything being extremely, extremely tough. Uh, but I did a bit of research and I found out that back in the 2008 recession, this is actually when some of the biggest startups we know today started, yeah. including Uber and Twitter yeah. and, 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 and this was the time when they actually started. It's like a list of like 10 to 15 startups. Um, so if you think about it, starting a startup on its own, usually in normal times, is someone who are getting into a very tough situation that no one from the billions of people around the world decided to go for but himself. Yeah. Um, so in reality, it's just a very tough uh, time. To be completely honest, I am one of those few people probably that think this is the best time to start your own thing. Because the, the world has completely changed. Now, how many people will, first of all, have the energy to do something at a time where everyone is depressed or taking a holiday? And number two, see this new opportunity. Because in normal life, if you have, I mean, probably someone saw that opportunity five years ago or 10 years ago. The world hasn't fundamentally changed in the last few years. Yeah. But in one day, the life, the world has changed. Can I be fast enough to be the first person to see this? Do I have enough energy uh, to make that happen? Now, in terms of resources, actually, VCs are still investing. Maybe they're investing in a different way. Maybe they're focused more, of course, on their previous uh, portfolio companies. Of course, it's not as easy, but they are still investing. Good ideas are still coming out and still getting funds. Um, so I am actually a lot more positive, Chris, uh, to be honest. I think this is our chance to be 
actual entrepreneurs finding that niche market in this new world that, that we live in. Um, yeah, I think. Uh, I, I guess what I was trying to allude to with that, I think, I think people like you, me, Steve, et cetera, all of us are naturally extremely ambitious. Right. And yeah. I think we will always want to build things. I think that's the only thing you have, you have optimist uh, written on your t-shirt too. <laughs> I'm, I'm club, ost, club optimist. Um, but, <laughs> but, um, I think my question is like more around urgency. I feel like, yeah. um, I mean, I'm always going to be a builder. I think Steve's always going to be a builder. I think you're always going to be a builder. I think that's who we are. I'm just wondering a big part of me was like, you know what? Um, let's start a company in advisory. Let's just, you know, leverage our experience, make a bit of money, but let's chill out a little bit and figure out our next steps uh, and do it at the right time. And with COVID coming around, I guess my question was, I'm assuming all that's out the window and that we need to move faster and we need to build faster. We need, we need to get back to solving problems faster. Yeah. Um, that's how I feel. Um, and, and to give you an example of what that means, you know, yes, we have an advisory, um, but we've also fast tracked, um, you know, um, you know, uh, a new startup and a new product that we're working on as a company as well. Mm -hmm. we, we decided we were going to launch a new company that might help solve a problem. And yeah. that was always in the plans, but it wasn't, it wasn't an immediate thing that we wanted to do. We wanted to do it probably towards Q1 or Q2 next year. Whereas now we said, you know, fuck it. Um, we need to do it now. Like if this helps yeah. people, if we really believe that it's going to help people, we need to do it now. And yeah. so I'm wondering if you see it the same way. Has, has COVID accelerated things um, generally in the urgency for you? Do you feel that, that, that pressure? So for me specifically, not necessarily in that way. Um, but what it did is, is pose the question that you, that you mentioned a few minutes ago, which is, how are we now responsible? Like, how can we now help? We're very lucky. We're very grateful. Now, how can we help everyone else? And uh, I, I can't tell you, I have like a very clear answer that I'm just working yeah. on at the moment. It's not that easy to answer. And you know, all the time when you're scrolling through your Facebook or through, through the news, you think like, you know, there are so many opportunities. Should I help people that have uh, hospitals that are working on COVID-19? Should I help people in Lebanon? Should you help people in like, who really do you help and how do you put all your efforts and resources, whether it's time and money? It's not an easy question uh, to answer. Uh, me personally, how I'm do doing it is on the side of everything I mentioned that I'm doing initially, like uh, in the beginning of the conversation, I'm also helping NGOs out with my knowledge. Believe it or not, there's a lot of common uh, things in how you run a startup to how you run an NGO. You'd be surprised. Um, so that's one thing I'm using my knowledge in, in the startup world to help uh, those NGOs grow as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> just on, on this, I think, because uh, I think it's a really good point. Um, I think um, one key thing to think about, the, the contrarian thinking um, is something um, you had just alluded to, Hedy, where a lot of people would say, now's not a good time. Now is an absolutely great time. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, in society today, so society globally is going through, without doubt, our generation's biggest yeah. shift um you know brought on by a multitude of factors so society is going through a huge change therefore there is tons of opportunity to to, to kind of help aid that change and also pull out things that are going to be more um, impactful in the future i think one of the things chris you and i have spoken about quite a bit is um th th there seems to be a distinct lack of innovation on certain things so if mm -hmm. we talk about starting a business and startups uh, solving problems innovate on problems don't just build on top of them you know so oh i can we can tweak this here and you know uh, there's small subtle changes that can be made but actual innovation and total change um is actually what's required instead of just kind of plastering over or just tweaking uh, things here i think uh, i think now's a great opportunity for any um you know buddy an entrepreneur or anyone who's out there trying to think what can i do what can i start um just think of a, a blank canvas and do things differently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's a lot really of different. Yeah, yeah. I, I wish people would innovate instead of optimize. Right? There's a lot of yeah. what we're seeing in the region as well is is lots of new startups, lots of new companies, you know, starting but um, entering in competitive spaces with no real kind of uh, 
competitive advantage or innovation. We're seeing a lot of companies launch, in my opinion, in our humble opinion, as well, I think Steve and I align on this. <laughs> we think, we're seeing a ton of startups, but just doing the same thing as somebody else and maybe optimizing a little bit. But in terms of true, true, true innovation, really you know, approaching a problem and, and having a different solution for it, we're seeing less of that. And I hope, I hope that changes. I hope that changes. No, I, I agree a hundred percent with you guys. That's why I was saying we still need to see that startup coming out of our region that just goes completely global. And it's not yeah. an idea that we're imitating or exactly. inspired by the U S or Europe. Yeah. 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 And I really, I really, and I really think an important um, kind of mindset shift is, I think for a long time, we've spoken about efficiency you know, you've got to be an efficient uh, startup, you know, create something that, um, you know, that is efficient as a, as a business. I actually think we're, we're transitioning a bit and resilience is going to be such an important piece, but, you know, in yeah. when it comes to the way a business is set up and uh, the problem that it's trying to solve, the, the future looking aspect of it. Um, because today with the access to technology and the speed that technology is changing uh, society, it's really trying to take it slightly different approach. So, I, and, I, and I think it's a key message to take away, which is the, you know, the mindset has to be different. I think innovation has to be there, not just optimization. No, I'm not saying optimization is bad. Um, and I, and I, really, I really would say that uh, you're, you're building for a, a completely different future. Yeah. A completely different future. If anyone still believes that we're going back pre-COVID, then they still haven't come to terms with the fact that society has fundamentally changed globally. Forever different, yeah. Forever different. <clears throat> Absolutely. Makes sense. Absolutely. Makes sense. Hadir, it's great having you on. We've been talking and rambling for like an hour. <laughs> um, we really appreciate you taking the time to speak to us. Um, really can't wait to see you. Um, and um, hopefully we see each other soon. I'm still in Montreal, by the way. I'm going to be back in Dubai first week of September, I think. Um, where are you at the moment, by the way? Uh, so I'm in Cairo now. I'm not in Cairo, actually. I'm in the North Coast, uh, okay. which is by the beach. I'm spending the summer here, given that I don't have a full-time job. So uh, lucky that uh, you can work Amazing. online these days. Amazing. Uh, How can people yeah. find you, Hedia? <laughs> <laughs> cool. so I'm disappearing here by the beach. Uh, but I'm cool. coming to Dubai second week of September, so hopefully okay. I can catch up with you guys. Perfect. And uh, I'm very happy we just had this call. It's uh, great to reminisce over the past and uh, think of all those amazing memories with people like you. Um, so thank you so much for having me, really. It was a blast. Awesome. awesome. Thanks, Thanks very much, Adir. Take care. <laughs>